to do to start with, right? So, uh, first of all, hey, Patrick, uh, thanks for for joining this webinar. Uh, Thank you, uh, for a lot of people knows you already, the, probably the Swedes, anyhow. Uh, but for the rest, uh, I can make a short, short introduction, and Patrick will be uh, do a longer one. So, Patrick, for for you who know me, he is my go-to person when it comes to modern technology. So this is not my comfort zone, right? I'm the the IBM I guy, <clears throat> but of course I work in in the IT industry, so we are not totally isolated to to new technologies such as the uh, agenda we have today around the containers and stuff. But and I've been listening to the IT industry in this uh, from this perspective for long long time and I think I have a good grip of what it is in general but every time I talk to Patrick there's always something that I, I misunderstood or that you <laughs> he has to clear uh, careful, clarify for me. Anyhow we work together so we know each other since long we work together in IBM uh, and I quit a long time ago it's 2008 already but you stayed, uh, but since 2017, is it when you went to Konoha, where Correct. you've been working around this technology? So before giving handing over to you, Patrick, also this will be hopefully a lot of discussion. I have a, a lot of questions, so I will ask them probably during the the, the webinar. Also for the rest of you, you're all muted, uh, but you can raise your hand. You can uh, chat, ask questions in the chat. I will try to, to keep an eye on that and let you in if that's uh, appropriate. Uh, or we can have some questions at the end. We can be very, very agile is the word today, I think. Uh, I think you can go ahead, Patrick. Uh, and once again, thank you for doing this for us. Thank you, Torbjörn. So I'm just making sure that my clicking through here worked. So as Torbjörn said, uh, my name is Patrick Gunnarsten. I work at the uh, company based in Stockholm that's called Kunoa. Um, I'm going to do a short introduction to that. So my, my background uh, in the IT industry goes back to 2001, uh, where I started at IBM. And I, I stayed there to, until 2017. And pretty much the whole time I was touching one way or the other IBM power systems. So that's my kind of background. Um, I'll, uh, the session today is kind of meant to give you an, uh, at least my view of uh, an introduction to what container technologies basically is. So some of it is going to be very basic, some of it is going to be very simplified, um, but I'm really happy to take any questions and kind of, you know, dig deeper into it. But it's, my experience is that it, it's a good idea to start kind of easy and, uh, and, and take it from there. So, um, Let's get going. And I'll see if I can place my chat window so I can see if there comes any questions. So um, I'll start with a short introduction. Uh, I think you've seen the agenda on the website you know, with the invitation to the um, webinar. So I'm gonna to try to stick to that as much as I can. So go through containers, uh, some of the buzzwords, Kubernetes, where it is, um, touch on the ecosystem around this, and then there's a whole lot of stuff that's really new and really different. And um, this is also having an impact from an organizational point of view that we see is potentially significant in, in some of the clients. So I'm going to touch on that as well. And then lastly, um, put this into perspective a little bit in regards to IBM Power System that I think that most of you uh, are working with one way or the other. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat um, or we open up uh, at the end, I think, Torbjörn, so we can take it uh, verbally as well. Yeah, and, and one question already came in, and that is, of course, if this is recorded, I, I forgot to say, uh, this session is recorded. We will see how it will be distributed afterward. It depends a little bit, I guess, uh, but uh, it's good for everyone to know. And the answer was already answered in the chat. So if no one saw it before, uh, please open the chat window. Okay, go ahead. Good, so Konoa, what do we do? I mean, this is the simple explanation. We build Kubernetes and container platforms. And why are we doing this? Uh, it goes back to, I think it's 2015, where, where Docker, who's the kind of the, the origins for the container platforms, 
Um, that year, they commercially kind of established themselves in, in Europe, uh, you know, started to build a sales organization basically in, in Europe. And um, with that, we were picked as the first partner in the Nordics and one of the two, three first in, in Europe. So we've been doing this for a long time. And, um, you know, fast forward since, since the beginning where, you know, we, we, we didn't have a clue what it was basically, uh, of course, in the beginning, no one did. Um, today, over the you know span of those five years, we have kind of restructured ourselves. So all our consultants today are uh, working with this. Uh, we have partnered up with uh, a whole bunch of other players in this market. I'm going to touch on that. Um, but primarily, the most important thing is that we have done a large number of uh, enterprise implementations of. Uh, Kubernetes and then container platforms on a large number of uh, clients in primarily Sweden, but to some extent in Nordics ex, as Nordics as um, as well. Um, we are roughly 30 people today. We're hiring as fast as we can. We never stop hiring. Basically, um, problem is to find people with the right competence in this area. It's new, um, and at the same time, we we work mostly in enterprise environments. So you need to be able to understand that you can do this simple, but sometimes you also have a lot of rules and regulations and uh, you know, complex organizations, a lot of uh, things that you need to integrate with, uh, siloed organizations, you know, politics within clients, etc. So you need to be able to manage that all together in, into a good solution for, for clients. So effect of that is that primarily we're working with larger clients today. We're also a member of CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which owns the Kubernetes project, so to speak. It's a non-profit part of the Linux Foundation, um, and it kind of takes care of Kubernetes and the whole ecosystem around it. And I'm gonna come back to that as well. So primary, the primary reason for us, you know, going into the, the CNCF as a, as a member is that we also do Today, uh, we were the first partner in the Nordics to deliver the official Kubernetes education. So we do a lot of training as well. A couple of people that, that do training, you know, all day. So everything from public courses to specific tailored ones for, for um, you know, single clients, for example. Um, you know, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, the corner of this today, which is the Kubernetes and container piece. I'm not going to talk much about the other parts. Uh, you know, data center and cloud is, you know, you have to run it somewhere. We don't really care and our clients um, usually are in both places. Um, the thing that might be interesting to add is that what we've done the last two years and we see is becoming a very important part to be successful in, in, in larger scale implementations is onboarding onto the platform, making sure that everyone knows how to, you know, move their applications basically from you know, the traditional way of, of having them today, usually monolithic, and how do you transform them into the container platform and move them? And which one do you move and which one don't you move? Because right? not everyone, not everything is going to be suited to run in the container platform. Um, and we do this from the beginning to the end, basically. So that's the kind of sales pitch for Kanoa, what we add. Uh, but I think it's important to get that in here because it also means that we, we do have today a lot of experience from a lot of clients. We, we work with all the banks, um, all the telcos, a lot of the insurance companies, um, defense, public sector. So we're starting to build a you know, fairly good knowledge base of, of what works and you know, what doesn't. Um, also important in this, I think, is all the, the, the partnerships that we have. Uh, and as you can see, you probably recognize some logos and some you probably don't recognize. And the reason for that is that we are building this ecosystem around, you know, container and Kubernetes technologies. And there's some new companies popping up here doing specific things that there, you know, there, there wasn't a solution for it before, like security, container security, for example. Um, from a platform perspective, we, we work both with, um, you know, Documentis as we started with, um, but also Red Hat OpenShift um, and, and Rancher, which we see are the three main ones that also Swedish clients are, are looking at and, and, and choosing. 
Um, and we do this to stay on top, basically, on, on technologies. To, you know, we have the highest partnerships with all of those. So we have direct channels into support um, organizations, etc. cetera. Um, so the subject of today, what is a container? The uh, simple you know, answer is this. Everyone has seen a, a real physical container. But why do we have them? Um, and if you go back to you know, the real physical world before we actually had those containers, this was the way that we were shipping things around the world. So if you want, wanted to you know, move things from one part of the world to the other, you, you loaded things on, on ships like this, which took days and weeks. Um, so long time to ship things. Also, how do you keep track of what of these different bags are going where? And how do you protect them? You know, um, how, how much gets damaged on the way? Um, and how can you secure that it's actually the same stuff reaching, you know, the end client um, as you were shipping? And, and someone came up with the, the clever idea of, of why don't we put it in a standardized container, um, which comes with a number of different you know, benefits. Um, it's easy to, to ship and load. Uh, you know, you can move it from uh, from the dock onto to a boat, onto a train, onto a, a truck. You know, it takes minutes to move it. Um, and you also know whatever you put into whatever container, uh, you, you close it and you seal it, and you can be sure that that's also what reaches the receiver. Because no one can, can touch, you know, the contents of the container. It's protected. Uh, you can't manipulate it. You can't really do anything with it. So it's a it's a secure way of shipping things uh, with a lot of you know added benefits. And moving into our world and IT, and we all know the uh, kind of the environments that we've been working with the last you know 15, 20 years, which is you know virtualized environments and uh, monolithic applications. And the idea with the container in IT is exactly the same. Um, as it is in the physical world. So if we take an, an you know, slightly simplified case, but we have a team here doing development, they're developing some kind of application. So they need an environment, they need a server to do that on, you need an operating system, uh, you need a, a bunch of add-on stuff. So it might be Java applications, you need a, need a Java engine, a specific version, the operating system need to be specific distribution, specific version. Um, and you have some added you know, middleware products in maybe like uh, WebSphere or JBoss or, or something else. You build your application, then you want to test it. So you need to go to the server team, request the server, install the operating system, and then you know, install all the whole stack. There needs to be the right version of everything and you can test it and hopefully it works. Same thing then moving it into production. And as most of us know, this takes time. It's not a seamless process. There's a lot of different teams involved. There's a lot of manual stuff that needs to be done. And there's a lot of things that basically can go wrong. Also, from a application development perspective, looking at those clients that, that do their own applications, um, if you want to change a little small thing in your production environment or upgrade a small component, you need to start over again with this whole chain, which takes time. So the concept and the idea of, of the container is to take everything that you need to run um, in order to run your application and to put it into a container. Um, so if we're simplifying it then, let's imagine that all the components that you need, all the software, all the exact versions, the configuration of it, uh, what it needs to communicate, etc. All of that you put into this container. So the developer sits on his desktop, do this, and he's done. And he sends the container over to the test environment. And a couple of seconds later, you can spin it up in your test environment. The only thing that you don't package into a container from the traditional stack is the operating system. So every container on a physical server shares one underlying operating system. Because the operating system is you know, big and complex and you don't really want to ship that around. It's, it's a big installation usually. While a container is, one of the ideas is to, to break things down into microservices and have different containers do specific pieces of 
work. So it's very easy to kind of update them and, and uh, you know, ship them around basically. And next step, you ship it over to production. And if something goes wrong here, or you want to change something, you just go back and, and you know, make that little tweak, update that little piece of code, and, and you go through this whole process again. Faster, secure, and you are certain that you're actually testing exactly the same stack in each step. A quick question, <clears throat> Patrick. Does the operating system has to be on the exact same level here? Is that not so important? Um, that's a good question. I'm actually not 100% sure if it has to be. It's a good idea if it is. And usually within the same cluster, you would have it on the same version. Um, but it doesn't have to be because, you know, the notion here is that I'm saying that you're shipping a container. Um, really, you don't. You, you, you never ship a container. You restart a container. And I'll come to that in the next slide and, and, and explain the difference. So. Every time you you move a container, you, you restart it on, on a new place. So it, it's going to work. Um, no, it, you, you don't have to have the same version of the operating system underneath. No. OK. Um, so moving that kind of thought along then. Um, why did I go backwards? There. So another thing that the people are talking about in this is, is concept of build, ship, and run. And as I just said, what you really aren't doing is that you're not moving workloads. You're not moving the same container around. So the developers, he, uh, he, does, his, he does his work, put it into a container, but that container, it, it doesn't have physically all that code. It, it has a YAML file, which is basically an, an, an instruction manual saying that this is what I need to build my container. And, and all those pieces of code that you then need uh, to download and, and, and install to get a fully functioning you know, working container, you store that in a registry. Um, and that's where you, you, you kind of save all your code. And this could be one registry, it could be multiple ones. It could be your own registry, it could be a public one. And every time then that you want to deploy that container again, you, you fetch that piece of code from that registry, which means that you can deploy it anywhere. It doesn't matter. You can deploy it in your data center, in the public cloud, and, you know, in Sweden, in Australia, in US, doesn't matter. As long as you have a, a container platform um, you know, in place, you can deploy your containers there. And each time it will download you know, according to those instructions, it, it would download those pieces of code that you need to, to build your, your container. Um, and the benefits of this is kind of, it's, you know, there's multiple benefits. You can imagine use cases, for example, where you want to scale your workloads out of your data center. You just, you know, deploy them on, on, a, on a public cloud, for example, or in a other data center that you have somewhere. Um, there could also be cases where um, where you uh, want to have different versions, so you want to test, you know, production uh, version A or production version B. You can deploy both of them, and you can just kill one when when you think the you know version B is done, um, or or you know completed all the tests and it's fully work, you know, working. Um, if you want to migrate your, your workload, so you want to close down your own data center, and you want to move it to another. The, the old concept of migrating your, your workloads is, is, is very, very hard, um, very time consuming. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be moved, et cetera. Um, whilst in this case, you just you know, build a new container platform in the new data center. And then from there, you just restart your whole environment, basically. So you don't have a traditional migration in, in that sense that you, you have with the uh, you know, VM-based um, applications. So while I take a sip of water, you can read Gilbert. It's always good. So we kind of touched on containers. Uh, that's the basic building block. That's what execute your code. But what everyone is talking about at the moment is Kubernetes. So what is Kubernetes and, and what do we do with it? And why do we need it? 
So very simple, um, Kubernetes is a way to manage containers. As you can imagine, you know, doing it like this, if you have large scale deployments in a containerized world, you're gonna end up with thousands of containers. Um, even small, you know, use cases usually have very, very quickly hundreds of, of containers going up and down and, and moving around. So you don't want to keep track of those and it's, it's virtually impossible. Um, so Kubernetes is the key to manage and control your containers basically. And, you know, with that said, I think it's usually easier, you know, easy to kind of explain it this way by, by saying a few things that Kubernetes actually does. What value does it, you know, does it bring? And if you look at the traditional world, there's a, if you have VMs, uh, virtualized environments, traditional applications, you spend a lot of time deciding, designing and implementing things like high availability, you know, auto scaling, uh, how do you simplify your maintenance, etc. All of that stuff is, is built in by, by default in Kubernetes, out of the box. You know, standard plain vanilla Kubernetes does all of this. So from an application perspective, it means that every single container that is running, if it stops for whatever reason that is, contain, you know, Kubernetes will see that and it will automatically redeploy that container, um, trying to keep it up you know, and, and available. There's also some functions in that. So let's say you have um, application X version 1.0, uh, works fine. You run it for, 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 for some time. Um, and then all of a sudden you come with a new version 1.1, you deploy that one uh, and close down version 1.0. And you have some issues in 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, Kubernetes can automatically kind of detect some of that and, and and then try to restart that one, it still doesn't work. So it rolled back to a previous version that actually did work, yeah, the 1.0 in this case then. Um, also high availability from a physical perspective, um, Kubernetes um, is a clustered solution. So you need a minimum of three nodes and there's really is no upper limit. Uh, Usually clients uh, start with maybe more than three nodes, you know, three nodes in, in, in the test cluster maybe, but you know, usually it, it goes bigger pretty fast, but a minimum is three nodes. And if one of those nodes fails, Kubernetes will see that and it will automatically redeploy every container that was running on that node on other nodes that are up and available. So node one goes down, all of those containers will be redeployed on node two and three. So, <clears throat> sorry, this is a little bit like RAID <laughs> control, right? On hard disk drives, if one fail, it, it will automatically rebuild the data. Ah, clever, clever. Kind yeah. of, but you don't kind rebuild of, okay. anything, you just redeploy it because you, uh, you didn't lose anything. You have your registry where all your code is stored and Kubernetes know what containers were running. So it will just apply a restart basically of all of those uh, containers. So it doesn't take hours or days or weeks like a RAID rebuild can take. This takes seconds or minutes depending on how large those files are, are and you know how fast your storage system is basically. Okay, but then the question about the registry then, because that's the single point of failure. Where is that located and how? Yeah, now, now we're going that? into the non-simplified stuff and it's uh, an ex extremely valid question because the registry is one of those things that you need to think about, you know, pretty carefully outside of Kubernetes. It's an external source, um, and they are, there's, there, you know, they can be multiple places, uh, and there are public places um, where you can, you know, download stuff. But maybe you don't want to do that. So you, this is one of the areas where you need to to design what you want to run in Kubernetes and and. Where do you get those sources? You know, where, where is that code stored and how is it secured? How is it scanned? And how do you ensure you don't, you know, download and run anything in your cluster? Okay, um, thanks for the answer. Um, okay, so going forward. So also automatic scaling. So um, we have this, uh, 
node one is failing and, uh, and the workloads running on those doesn't fit on node two and three. So we need a new node. Um, Kubernetes can automatically, you know, spin up a new node uh, and, uh, you know, place new workloads there basically. Um, and uh, the same goes the other way. So if you have, you know, 10 nodes and all of a sudden you, you don't need 10 nodes, you, nine is enough, it, it can scale down to nine nodes and, and shut the tenth one off as well, which is uh, can be pretty important if you're running in public cloud, for example, you don't want to pay for stuff you, that you don't use. Uh, maintenance, same, um, you simply vacate uh, a node that you need to take down, you, you want to put more memory in your node one, you simply run a command and all of those applications are moved. Well, they are not actually moved, they are restarted or, or started up again on another node. And once they are up and running on the new nodes, you, you steer the traffic over to them and, and kill the one on, on node one. So you don't see an application downtime either by, by, by doing this. Um, and of course, there's some scheduling uh, in this, so it utilizes the, uh, the, uh, the cluster nodes that you have in a, in a, in a smart way. So it, it spreads out the workloads, it can rebalance workloads and, and you know, move it around so you get a, um, a good even workloads. Um, you can also, of course, you know, do active management on this and, and, and have specific nodes do specific um, applications that have specific demands for network or low latency storage, et, et cetera. So this is why Kubernetes is so hot today, because it simplifies a lot of stuff that, that used to be really complicated to, to manage and, and get control over. And this just works. Same time, uh, what does Kubernetes not do? And, uh, and Tobion was into this um, with uh, repositories, because Kubernetes does not care what container you want to start. As long as someone tells Kubernetes to start this container, it's gonna start it. And it has no clue of where that container comes from, uh, what it contains, um, if it's allowed to run it, if it has uh, vulnerabilities in it, etc. So you need to think about those things and, and build, a, build an environment that uh, is secure, of course, that you have some kind of functions and policies around what can you run? Uh, what are you allowed to run? Who can start it, um, et cetera. So there's no security basically from that perspective built into Kubernetes. You need external tools and, um, and solutions for that. Also, and, and you know, I don't think you have problems understanding this here, but there are people still that, that thinks that you can take your monolithic application and just throw it on a container platform and it's gonna run. Of course, it's not going to do that. So it doesn't build applications. It doesn't refactor applications for you to be suitable to run on a container environment. You need to do that yourself, or you need to, to buy whatever software that you're buying in the container format to run it on a container platform. Um, and as I said, you know, Kubernetes isn't magic in the sense that it knows that it needs to start things. Someone has to tell it what to start. And that's where the pipeline comes in, but you know, everyone is talking about as well. You need a pipeline that, uh, that does all the stuff uh, before that I described, you know, build, test, ship, store it in the right places, and, and then decide when to put it in production, et cetera. That's all happens in the, in, in the pipeline. And you can automate a lot of stuff in that pipeline. So you can do automated testing. Uh, you can have automated security policies that are applied or, or you get a check, so a developer puts his code in, goes to testing, it automatically tested, it comes back with a flag saying that you're not fulfilling this uh, network requirements, please redo this. You, you redo it, it passes the flag, and then it goes to the next step in, in production, for example. That's pipeline. Um, there's no services built into Kubernetes as well from an application level, so there's no middleware in there. There's no databases or, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, web servers or anything like that. Uh, Kubernetes is just this management piece of, of, of code. Uh, but of course you can run all of that as a container in your Kubernetes world. There also isn't any complete solutions built into Kubernetes for uh, things like monitoring, logging or alerts. Um, all of those functions or mechanisms uh, that's needed 
to, to collect that type of data and to do that is available in Kubernetes and is exposed via uh, APIs, for example. So you will need to add some kind of, of tool uh, yourself or, or build it or, or buy it or you know whatever way you want to do it. But you need to bring that piece one way or another to Kubernetes. Kubernetes doesn't have that. Patrick, and Kubernetes, yeah. Sorry to interrupt again, but this is, is it sounds like it's still, um, you need a lot of, well, I think you will touch it later, but this is why you need a lot of different tools and vendors uh, and the, the marketplace grows, uh, or the landscape, they call it, right? Uh, grows pretty, but will you touch what you need? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna touch basics. on that uh, and okay. I'm gonna explain it. I just wanted to put into perspective what, what Kubernetes, what the piece of Kubernetes ah. does and uh, doesn't do, because a lot of people are talking about Kubernetes as the uh, as the magic, as, as you know, you we have Kubernetes, now we have containers. Uh, and and we're you set. Don't. okay, yeah. It's just one very, crucial component. It's not the only option that you have. There's other, there's other management tools out there as well, but Kubernetes is by far the most widely adopted one. And it's the one that's supported by pretty much everyone. And everyone that's building new container platforms today is virtually 100% are building them based on Kubernetes. Um, and and, and it, from that perspective, it is the key to everything that everything else hooks into. Um, Kubernetes as well, also be clear, it doesn't configure the underlying infrastructure. So if you want to add that fourth node into your cluster, um, it needs to be configured before it can be added. So you need to have either pre-configured resources or you need to have automated uh, tools or infrastructure as a code tool. So, you know, there's, there's different ways to do this, but some way of doing that provisioning of those servers so you can bring them into the cluster. Um, okay, so to put this into perspective and back to Tobias' question, if you look at the, uh, the left side of this chart, you will see the Kubernetes logo. Um, this is the CNCF landscape. So these are all the projects and technologies that in some shape or form are related to container technologies. And, and Kubernetes is that piece over on the left side. So this is a pretty complex um, chart, of course. Um, you know, you can barely read it. Uh, there's a um, uh, ton of stuff on it. So to make things a little bit easier, um, we have our own version of this, which is broken down into these um, you know, boxes. So basically what we talked about so far is the, is the bottom four. So the underlying infrastructure, you need an operating system, you need a container engine, and on top of that, you need your orchestrator, which is usually Kubernetes. Swarm is still used in a uh, you know, number of places, but, but Kubernetes is the one that's kind of taking over. Um, but then you have the things that also a lot of people have heard about, which is, you know, Docker, OpenShift and Red Hat, Rancher. These are platforms that um, that are built on top of Kubernetes. They, they, they you know, if, if you buy a um, Red Hat OpenShift platform, uh, which is a container as a service type uh, platform, it includes Kubernetes and a lot of these different tools that you see here. Not every one of them, but it has monitoring in there. There is storage solutions built into OpenShift, uh, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, adding that layer of, uh, of platform, buying a, a supported version of uh, Rancher or OpenShift or, or Documentis, that will take you, you know, a long way. Uh, and that will take you to a fully functioning, uh, you know, fully working, um, you know, entry level type uh, container platform. Um, but we talked about security, for example, how do you scan your, uh, um, your, um, your Docker flow, sorry, your, uh, your containers for, for um, vulnerabilities or, or harmful code, for example, um, because it doesn't work as, as the normal tools that you already have. The container is completely different. So you need you know, specialized security tools to look into those containers and to, to be able to judge if they have harmful code in them or not. Uh, and that is not built into you know, the platform choices. Um, 
OpenShift, uh, Ranch, and Docker doesn't have that. They have some limited functions in there, but they don't have the complete suite that you actually need if you want to run it in, in an enterprise environment. Um, same goes for storage. Um, Rancher has their own storage that you can add to it. Documentis actually don't really have it. They have a number of open source ones that they're pointing at. Um, OpenShift comes with uh, also uh, storage, which is uh, you know rather than Ceph basically. Um, but in many cases, they they might be good for certain use cases, but in many cases they aren't simply enough. So you would need to look at other type storage solutions, for example. Um, and, and storage works very differently with containers than it does in, in you, know, you know, the normal VM world where you know where your workloads are. Here they, they go down and they move and they pop up in new places. So how do you ensure that you, you have a container that has access to the storage it needs to have, for example? It works completely different. So the point really with this kind of slide is just to show that there's a lot of different pieces that you need to look at. So if you're considering uh, running a container platform and making it uh, in some kind of production state, some kind of you know, important uh, critical uh, applications running on it, you need to have a look at all of these boxes. You don't necessarily need all of them, um, but you, you definitely need to have to make an, uh, a decision whether you need it or not. So do you need a service mesh, for example? So what does service mesh do? Well, the big thing with, with service mesh, it keeps control over all of the traffic inside your cluster. So all the communication between the containers. Uh, and by default, that's not encrypted, which you might want to have. So an easy way to encrypt all traffic uh, with, within a cluster is to add a service mesh, for example. Um, but a lot of clients don't need that in the beginning, etc. But this is a good starting point. You need to, to have an, an, a notion of that a container platform is going to touch all of these areas, basically. And that also means, of course, that this is going to have an, an impact on the organization because this is not a siloed you know, environment. If you want to run a container platform, it needs network, it needs storage, it needs compute. It needs some kind of monitor, monitoring and then, you know, alert system, et cetera. And most clients already have that, but it's built for what they have and it's not built for containers. Uh, and basically whatever you have today um, for traditional you know, data center workloads basically doesn't meet all the requirements for container platform. So you will need to, to look at different uh, security policies, uh, different uh, network setups, um, different um, uh, storage, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which means that this gets complicated very fast. And especially if you have siloed organizations, um, this can become really time consuming to convince everyone that you need to change things because you do. Um, I can give you a couple of examples. Take storage, for example. We have, uh, we have one client where the platform team, the container platform team went to the storage team and said that this is the requirements. Uh, please provide us with storage that meet this. And client said, no, we can't. Um, so we can provide you this, um, which isn't enough. And then they go back and they, they fight with their storage supplier I think in this case, they've been going on for nine months uh, and still haven't come up with a solution that actually works based on the current storage supplier that they have. Um, we have another case where the storage team said that, no, not gonna happen. We're not gonna give you this. If you want this type of storage, you need to build it yourself. So they did. So they went around the storage team and build their own storage solution, which of course, over time is not a good you know, it's, it's not a good way of doing it. And the storage team usually is, is better equipped to make sure that you have your disaster recovery and retention rules, et cetera, uh, in place. Um, but the point here is that one of the key things that needs to happen for, be, for being successful with any type of, of uh, you know, production class containers um, is that you need to bring all of these together and you need to get them all on board and hopefully working together bringing solutions that is acceptable for everyone because there's going to be a lot of changes happening. Um, yeah, I see a comment here. We call that shadow IT and that's exactly where it is, which is never a good solution in, in, in the wrong, long run. 
Um, but there's been a lot of clients where this is happening because you have a, um, a C-level that says that need, this needs to happen, this needs to go live, and there's a deadline, we need to meet it. Um, and this is the prioritized project, which we have seen in 2020. There's a lot of projects that has been, been stopped, but the container projects haven't. They have you know, continued and gotten more resources in 2020. So this has been the way to kind of you know, move, them, move them along. Um, so it's a good idea to kind of have this with you when, when you're thinking containers. Um, so to kind of put this down a, a little bit into perspective into to IBM Power, can you do containers on IBM Power? And the answer is, of course, yes. You have been able to do that for, for a while. Um, supported solution is, is well at OpenShift. Uh, I think this latest version is 4.6, if I remember correctly. Um, if you have an enterprise type IBM server, you can run it on Power VM. If you have a, a Linux only scale out type server, you can run it on KVM. Um, but of course, it's, uh, you can't run you know, AIX applications or IBM I applications in a container. It, it needs to be Linux applications today. Um, there is a possibility to other platforms to run Windows containers as well, uh, but that's not supported on Power uh, for obvious reasons. Um, then uh, me and, uh, and um, Torben had a, a discussion the other day around what about moving you know, uh, you know, containers across platforms with, with different underlying hardware. Can you do that? Can you have a container running on an x86 platform and, and move it over to a power platform? And, and does it, is it going to work there? And uh, this is one of those things that hasn't, don't have an easy answer. Um, and and I'll, I'll dig into it. First of all, of course, there are, there are different instruction sets to talk to hardware for different um, processor architectures. So if you're installing Red Hat OpenShift on, on power, uh, the SLEA, or sorry, the, um, the Red Hat version that you're installing on your power machine is not going to be exactly the same one as you're installing on an x86. The binaries that are, are, are different in those two versions of the operating system. Uh, and the same for ARM and the same for a mainframe, of course. Uh, but with that said, let's say you have a use case of uh, you want to run a, a Redis database. So then you go into one of those repo the repositories that are available to download your, your Redis database, and you will find that there are four versions of that database to download, one for each processor architecture. So the code is slightly different and you could have different versions and the, you know, there could be differences in that code. So moving a container from one platform an x86 over to power, you know, probably isn't gonna work. But you're not doing that when you're redeploying stuff. So going back to the, uh, the pipeline, let's say that you have a use case here. So someone want to deploy that Redis database and you have two options. You have cluster A, which is x86 based, and you have cluster B, which is power based. Then of course you can have instructions built into the pipeline saying that if you want to deploy this on, uh, on cluster A, um, then you're downloading the x86 version and you're spinning that one up as a container uh, in that environment. Whereas if you want to deploy it or, or move it, um, and move by moving is kind of destroying it and starting it again, you have pointers saying that if you want to start it on, on cluster B, which is power based, um, then the instruction is to go and download that piece of code that is built for, for power. So it's not the clear yes and no answer to that question uh, because you're really redeploying workloads and there could be differences of course in those two versions. Um, so if that has an impact on something else, of course you need to be careful of you know, what, what you're deploying because it's not exactly the same piece of code. So Torbjorn, does that answer the question that you asked me the other day? It does kind of. It is still a little bit confusing for me to the, you know, not moving a container, but restarting it and not, it's independent of the underlying operating system but it depends. So I need to, to learn a bit more, but I guess uh, it's the best answer I can get, right? So I'm happy. 
Yeah, and I mean, if we if we simplify it, really, if you have a really really high level type application that has you know very simple instruction, has no dependencies whatsoever on the underlying operating system or infrastructure, you know that's going to work wherever you decide to deploy it, probably. Um, but then you need to know that. Um, so there there isn't a clear cut answer to that question, but yes. Containers work differently and, and you, you don't move them. We, we, we're talking about that we're moving workloads and we're moving containers, but you're not actually moving the same container. You're restarting the new one and killing the old one. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, uh, okay, so what would you run on IBM Power? And that's, I think is the tricky question that I don't really have a really, really good answer for. Uh, the obvious one that's been there for a couple of years now is, is cloud packs. So IBM, when they bought Red Hat, decided to, um, to make a package uh, where OpenShift is included um, and they have different bundles. So you can um, buy a cloud pack with OpenShift and you get a, a bunch of credits for IBM software basically in there. Uh, and those pieces of software would, would come as containers. So you could buy, you know, WebSphere or um, you know, DB2, et cetera, uh, as cloud packs. Um, and of course, those clients that, that have that today or are you know, considering buying that pieces of software, that would be a good use case of, of actually running on, on IBM Power for a number of different reasons. Um, usually they're also quite well tuned or, <clears throat> sorry, um, adapted to run on Power as well, you know, from a performance per perspective, for example. Um, I would also say that one of the cases that, that is, it is a niche case and it's not the traditional power server, but for those that are running AI training um, on GPU powered servers like the, the 922, for example, that is usually done based on containers and pretty much everything that has to do with AI training today is, uh, is done by, by containers. Uh, so there is a workload running on, on a number of you know, machines around the world, of course, today uh, on containers, on IBM Power, but it's a pretty specific use case and probably not applicable to, to most, most clients. Um, I just uh, wanted to add to this. Uh, another reason is, of course, there is in 99% of the cases, resources left uh, on the power server. If you have especially the IBM I side of things, right? Generally yeah. uh, speaking, they're using one or two cores, uh, power nines, right? And the, the rest is just laying around. They're not used. So this could be a good reason to to see, uh, to start loading things. And also, if you want to buy the build a hybrid cloud, you go to the IBM cloud, of course, and you start on-prem, and then you can use your own resources. And if you want to scale up, you can just uh, uh, restart them uh, on the power uh, power cloud. Yeah, yeah, and, and another example on that would, would be to look at you know what are you running on your IBM server today. You take the IBM I clients for example. Um, it's usually some kind of ERP system uh, like Infor for example. And if you're looking at that type of installation, if you take Infor as an example, now I'm not completely up to speed on, on the list of announcements from them, but. The typical setup would be that you run the, the core instance and the database on, on IBM Power. But then you have a lot of um, you know, add-on products and add-on installations that usually runs on, on Windows or on Linux on another server. So if you have that type of setup and you have an uh, application that um, have those kind of related applications that now run somewhere else, and if they are, are, are you know, available to run on Linux, for example, either run them on, on, on the VM, on your power box, or as a container. Um, but I think it needs to be, um, you, you need to look at what you have basically and, and find things that are related to the core stuff that usually runs on power, which is usually databases and, you know, heavy things like SAP and, and, and other ERP systems. Um, if you're looking at what's being deployed at the moment uh, as containers, it usually isn't that type of workload. So it isn't the, the, the large heavy backend databases. It's the lightweight stuff that scales well behind the load balancer on the web or an, an internet bank or you know things like that. Um, that is, is built from the beginning to, to scale out. 
and to be available that way. And then the databases, yeah, you can run a database as a container, but you wouldn't run, you know, large scale critical backend database yet uh, as a container in, in, in my view and my world anyway. So I think at the moment as well, IBM Power is still positioned in that corner where, where containers um, isn't the, the, the best fit at this date, basically. Um, but I think it's a good idea to start looking at containers and, and maybe try it and test it. You know, you can do it for free. Um, if you're looking at Rancher, for example, it's a completely free product. Uh, and the only thing that you can pay for there is support. So whatever, you know, there's one version to download and it's the enterprise version. So you can start playing around with it. Uh, actually not on power then, uh, you need to do, do it with OpenShift on power. Um, but, uh, and I assume you can, you can get that there, you know, virtually free anyway. There's an open source version of OpenShift as well. It's called OKD. Um, but just to understand the concept, uh, understand how it works, and to be able to kind of relate that to, to the IBM Power Platform. Um, and what we're seeing is that The, the applications that we're running today is the ones that are sell, but what's also happening is that there's a lot of software suppliers out there that sell you know, software that has stopped delivering their software as a VM. They only deliver it as, as, uh, um, as containers um, for a number of different reasons, because it's faster and easier to, to develop software that way, and then it's easier to distribute it as well. But also from a security perspective, so if you're looking at uh, software-defined storage as an example, we're seeing a lot of vendors going uh, away from the VM-based installation to container-based installation because if you get you know, that critical bug, for example, that whole chain of development, testing, and putting it out into production for download for clients is so much faster when it's container-based than VM-based. So, we, there's, there's, there's kind of a natural shift over to containers to, for certain type of workloads that benefit from that, that rapid develop and, and, and testing cycle, basically. Um, that's what I had. And uh, within time as well. Good, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, Good stuff in here. Still, uh, a lot. Of, it, it's obviously a quite well. The journey just started, right? So there is. A, I, I can see a lot of acquisitions in the futures to build the, the stacks, and and this is coming back to the to the IBM I and uh, well IBM side of things and the Red Hat. This was of course one of the huge uh, reason for the thirty plus billion dollar investment in Red Hat and. and also, just a short uh, comment about the cloud packs is this is a focus er area for IBM and there is still a lot of software from IBM that doesn't run on power. But uh, when, if you look at the, the plan planning uh, from IBM, it, a lot will happen this year, which is, of course, very, very good uh, to start with. Now you get Red Hat, the same version of, of uh, um, OpenShift runs on mainframe power in x86, which wasn't the case before. Uh, oh, I can start my video. Um, so that's a good start. And now we're waiting for more software to to uh, to run on power as well as uh, mainframe and x86, which is, is a good, good, cool. cool. Uh, good, let's see, do we have any questions? Not really, you, you um, kind of empty. And I think I had some pre-prepared -pre question and I was, you answered most of them. Uh, vendor lock in. This is something they talk they're talking about, and I got I pu published some some Gartner report on, on LinkedIn quite some time ago, and you were not very happy with it. They warned about the, the vendor lock in, and you told me, well, it depends. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, of course, there's uh, the possibility to do vendor lock-in. Uh, I would say the biggest uh, issue is probably uh, public cloud lock-in. So let's say you start um, running containers on AWS, as an example, or, or Azure or Google or IBM, doesn't matter. All of those public cloud providers have a lot of uh, you know, ready-made services. 
So if you have developers starting to build their code on, um, on AWS and they need a, a load balancer, you know, do they install it themselves or do, do they buy it as a, as a service on, on AWS? So you need storage. Do you install your own storage solution or do you buy S3 as a service or something else? Um, so the, the thing is uh, that one of the benefits of public cloud is to buy those services that are already ready-made and you don't need to care about them. They're being patched and, and updated and developed by, by the, the cloud vendor. But at the same time, that makes it virtually impossible to, to move your uh, you know, Kubernetes clusters out of that because you, you built an application that's dependent on specific services that runs only on that cloud. So if you want to move that environment, you, you, you need to redo it basically. Um, we've had a couple of clients that learned that uh, the hard way. So they, uh, they wanted to sell a solution, for example, they built it on a AWS uh, and they intended to run it as a service from AWS. And then they meet the first customer and they say that, <coughs> no, but we are in our own data center. We have uh, security rules, et cetera, et cetera. We cannot run it on AWS. It has to run in our data center which then of course is not possible. You need to redo the whole application landscape. Uh, so you have this lock-in. If you're looking at specific vendors, um, like uh, if you take Red Hat OpenShift, for example, one of the benefits with Red Hat OpenShift is that it comes with a lot of those uh, boxes pre-filled with products. So there's a lot of functionality built into Red Hat OpenShift out of the box. Um, but that also means that Red Hat has a very specific view on what version of what product do you want or, or do you going to use and, and what do we support? And which means that if you want to replace one of them with something else that you already have or that you think works better or is, is faster updated or something like that, the chances are it's not going to be supported by, by Red Hat. So that's also kind of vendor lock-in. Um, so it's, it's a question of weighing things against and for. Um, of course, you can build your own implementation of everything on the public cloud, which means that you can, you know, rebuild it anywhere else. So you can move out of AWS if you think that they're, you know, ripping you off with money. You just take that environment and spin it up again on, on, on resources in, in Google Cloud, for example. But that means that you have to build it yourself and maintain it yourself as well. Yeah, and I guess this is nothing new, right? So vendor lock-in, well, lock-in is one way of seeing it, but using the function, and this is that goes to the database as well. I mean, if you go to the Oracle site, very few people can move off the Oracle, uh, for example, right? So it's, uh, and again, as you said, either you buy it then as a service or you do it yourself, or, but maybe you can go, at least if you have that in mind, when you go and buy, you can make sure how easy it is, how much standard they are. Yeah. Or I mean, there, like there's, no, there, there's no right or wrong decision there. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of how informed decisions you're taking. So you need to be aware of all of this, of course. And, and that's why I highlighted this whole ecosystem, the whole, all these dependencies that you, you need to be aware of them. You need to take decisions somewhere on what way to go and, and how much you're gonna do yourself how much are you going to buy as a service, or how much you're going to get, you know, help with from external uh, sources? Mm. It's 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 nothing new with this this new technology, but you know the challenges are always the same. How how you know what choices do you make? Mm. Yeah, coming back to me as an IBMI guy, right? Talking about locking vendor locking, but I, as I wrote in my last uh, article, I said, well, this is a vendor that you you want to be locked in with. Uh, and actually, I'm very thankful for this. And we got some, some thanks from the audience, which is always appreciated. Uh, but again, for me, I'm very happy that people like you take care of this because I can go back to the IBMI side of things. We have the database, application, everything within one image, right? Well, it's already um, delivers and scale and everything. But again, coming back, and this was also good that you clarified. This is not for the backend, high-end transaction system that we usually work with, right? But of course, we need to, to have both sides. You can, the UI could be uh, cluster, uh, well, container-based. And also, especially, specifically, we need to open up the system to be uh, ready to, to deliver data to the, those clusters and so on. But uh, how to do this would be in the, in the future. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm being aware of that. You know, the the strong things about IBM Power is is still you know performance, scalability, and the reliability as as a platform. Uh, we should build by by great hardware, great software in there. You know, you control the whole stack, etc. Whereas containers are, of course, the complete opposite. They are built to be killed, thrown away. Uh, hardware doesn't matter because you have tons of it, etc. So it's a completely different concept. Yeah, and also from... it's a, it's a also the solving issues we don't have, right? So the systems that goes up and down, we need to have clusters. And nah, we don't need clusters because this system just runs, right? We we yeah. don't we need to scale because the x86 server doesn't scale, and you need another physical board. No, we just add cores because we have the scale up, uh, especially well the bigger machines anyhow. Okay, yeah, anyhow yeah. we're on the top of the hour <laughs> and. Uh, just yeah. the last comment there. It, it, that's yeah. the, the fundamental part of, of the applications that you're running because you have that SQL database. It's not built to be run in 50 different places. You know, yeah. you can't. Yeah. Whilst the, the typical application workload that is is that you're running on content, uh, they are built for that. They are built to run yeah. in 50 different places. And the kind of application where, for example, if you have a competition on television, you have to scale it up pretty fast, right, with the apps. But not yeah. necessarily the, the the transaction database at the at the in the back side. Okay, thank you very much again, uh, and again thank you the audience for for paying attention. And we will see. Maybe we will follow up on on another uh, webinar, Patrick. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye bye.